Welcome to Growing Your Dental Business, hosted by dental business coach and author, Benny Reed. This podcast is the ultimate resource to sharpen your focus and accelerate your results, ultimately leading to more profit at the end of every month. Here's your host, dental business coach, Penny Reed. Welcome to session two. In this session, I'm thrilled to have Dr. Wayne Kerr share his five ways to go from good to great in dentistry. Dr. Kerr practiced for over 30 years and ran a thriving dental office. He successfully transitioned out of his practice, yet his love for the profession is evident as he spends much of his time not only sharing his wisdom, but also his enthusiasm. And this fella is incredibly enthusiastic about dentistry, and he gives lectures around the country. At the end of this podcast, check out Wayne's bio on my website to learn more about him. And now to the interview. It's my pleasure to have Dr. Wayne Kerr on the Growing Your Dental Business show today. Wayne, I'll let you take it away. Well, good morning, Ms. Penny. What a delight and uh, great privilege it is for uh, me to have this opportunity to have a conversation with you on five ways to take a practice from good to great. I think today we'll talk about being visible, especially as a leader in the community. Uh, the impact the morning huddle has on the day, the importance of seeing patients on time and how to make that happen, why we should greet our patients by name, and finally, how listening well builds trust. I want to start by talking about being visible. No question that today's technology allows any dental practice to be highly visible to potential new patients through practice websites, Facebook Google searches, health grades, Yelp, and other means of social media. But getting outside your office and into the community builds goodwill, enhances your brand, establishes you as a leader, contributes to good press, and absolutely does build your practice. Penny, I've always believed that by being visible and active in your community, you become known, liked, respected, and trusted. I believe it's just plain good business to give back to the community, which makes your practice possible. I really do. There's lots of ways you can do that. Um, Certainly, one of the easiest opportunities is to join a service club. There are many leadership opportunities available in Kiwanis, Rotary, Pilot, Lions Club, the American Business Women's Association, And as a leader in your community, you have many opportunities to serve as a volunteer on a board, such as United Way, American Heart Association, American Cancer Society, March of Dimes, Habitat for Humanity. Can be a little risky, but I do know uh, dentists who have held elected uh, offices, such as city councilman, school board, or even a, a county commissioner. Obviously, there are great opportunities to serve uh, through your Chamber of Commerce. And I think one of the best vehicles to be seen and be visible in your community is to align yourself with your local high school. Um, My wife and I had great success uh, being associated with our high school drama program. We were very fortunate that our high school was one of the top two or three uh, drama programs in the state year after year. And for nine years, uh, I built sets, uh, contributed uh, uh, shop supplies, lumber, tools. My wife uh, designed props and costumes and printed out the programs. And each year, we uh, rented out the theater on opening night for the spring musical I got 600 seats for a $1,000 donation and uh, filled that theater with my patients every single year for nine years. My patients still talk about how great that was. And something else that I don't think a young practice would necessarily think about, and that is if, if that practice is really in growth, if it's a relatively new practice, you're going to spend probably 3 to 5% of your monthly gross uh, to marketing. And, and I'm sure you know a lot more about that than I do. But even if you're struggling and you're, maybe you're grossing 30000 a month, 
three percent of that that's nine hundred dollars five percent is fifteen hundred dollars if you earmark a hundred dollars a month for a specific local organization like your high school band for example or or maybe you're a sponsor for one of the athletic programs it's unbelievable how much goodwill you can establish in your community for such a small amount of money don't you agree oh absolutely and it's it's just like anything else as a young person or, you know, we're saying someone starting out or let's say you really haven't been putting that money aside because I've unfortunately encountered quite a few practices through the years that have felt like they couldn't afford to do it. Once you begin to set it aside, you may not start at 3% if you haven't been doing it at all. Uh, but it is absolutely necessary to have that money for marketing. And I also think I would love for you to touch on some of the things that you've done that perhaps you involved your team in, because I think when when you can also incorporate your team in those service projects, it I don't know anything short of the term magic. It, it really creates a bonding experience. Oh, it really does, and and certainly we we always took advantage of the Chamber of Commerce uh, Small Business Expo. Uh, mm-hmm. We absolutely uh, uh, were all there as a team in our uh, non-clinical garb, but uh, with our name tags. And we, of course, had uh, multiple marketing uh, uh, items to just give away. Uh, people love free stuff, and, and what a great opportunity to, to have your logo spread uh, all across the uh, community. And, and, of course, today it would be your practice website um, mm-hmm. as well as your phone number. Uh, other team events we did were participating in, in a number of school programs, uh, uh, obviously um, uh, Give Kids a Smile, uh, Special Olympics, and uh, and the uh, February uh, Dental Health um, uh, Program that the ADA sponsors. Uh, lots of great team opportunities. Uh, and, and, of course, with Facebook, uh, practice Facebook, today, um, you can have non-clinical things that the team does together uh, to establish goodwill for the practice. Well, and I think often when, you know, offices will look at me and it's, well, what do we post on Facebook or where do we get content? And I think when we first started posting on social media, we felt like we had to post educational content, which most patients really, I mean, I think whether it's dentistry or chiropractic or optometry, they really are not that interested in yeah, in being educated when, when they're on social media. They want to be entertained. So I always say social media is social, and it's it's your platform to broadcast the things that you're doing in the community. So when you're out, whether it's a, a service organization or a meeting or maybe you're dropping donuts off at some other offices in the community, that's your material for social media. So it's, I think sometimes we forget, we a lot of people it's more comfortable to hide behind that phone screen or the computer screen, but it's really a way to give more boost to the things that you're already doing. So I, I love that you led off with this because so many people would think being visible only means online or paid advertising, and you've started with where I believe the core of it is. It, it's what we're doing uh, in the office and in the community that's most important. And then the actual ad paid advertising is like the maybe not even the frosting on the cake. It may be the little flowers that are stuck into the frosting on the cake. Uh, but that that is, uh, in my opinion, where you go last, where you go first is what you're talking about with the visibility and involvement. Very well said, Ms. Penny. Thank you. That's uh, uh, right there with you. Second comment I'd like to uh, bring up is the fact that not all practices uh, embrace the concept of a morning huddle. And that's unfortunate. I I think it's the very best tool to set the tone for the day. Spending just 10 to 15 minutes uh, planning each day with your team clarifies a number of issues. For example, are we seeing any new patients today? Is the paperwork complete? Was this patient invited to our practice by a patient of record? Um, What do we know about this patient? And obviously the office manager needs to share all the information possible from that initial telephone interview. Uh, Are we completing any major treatment today? Is all the lab work here? Do we want to celebrate uh, this patient's accomplishment? And if so, how? Are we seeing any patients of record who have a special event in their lives, maybe a birthday, 
an anniversary, or maybe it's an anniversary in the practice. Maybe they've been with us for 10 years, and we would like to give them flowers or a gift card. Are any patients moving from hygiene to restorative? And if so, where would we do the exam, with the hygienist or just later in the operatory? And importantly, do we have any patients moving from restorative to hygiene? And if so, will the patient be numb? Uh, does the hygienist need to be aware that a temporary will be in place? Are we seeing patients today with incomplete treatment? And if so, why? Is there a financial issue that we need to address? Is it near the end of the year and the patient is waiting for new benefits? Do we fail to adequately educate the patient as to why we've recommended the treatment to begin with? Do we need to revisit that issue with a, an interoral camera review or perhaps show an educational video? Are we seeing any patients of record whose family members are overdue? And are we seeing anyone for the final time because they're moving and leaving the practice? Do we need to uh, get a release sign for transfer of records and are the records in order? Is there an opportunity for any same-day dentistry should the need arise? And, of course, when is the best time of the day to work in uh, an emergency? Now, this probably isn't a complete list, but in my mind, these are things that should be discussed uh, each day because each day is a new day as we see new patients with different needs. And I think if we start each day strong, we end the day strong, and as each day builds on itself, the year ends strong, and, and you have a greater chance of realizing your goals. I think the morning huddle is absolutely critical to taking a practice from good to great. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And one of the things, I got cracked up at a dental meeting where I was a few weeks ago, and I a dentist came up to me during the break, and we were talking, and he laughed. He said, yeah, you're talking about the morning huddle. He said, we run a no-huddle offense. And I thought, <laughs> "That's yeah." I, I laughed. And I thought, okay, what? how many professional teams consistently run a no-huddle offense? Yeah. That's what yeah. you do when you only have a few seconds on the clock. And I'm, mm. you know, which if if you were to make that a movie example, I picture Indiana Jones running with the giant stone running, you know, rolling behind him. That's and great. and what a terrible way to start your day. <laughs> um, so no, I'm a huge, huge fan of the huddle, and I think you touched on most things. One thing I would love to add is when we show up for the huddle and we're not prepared. It can take, that list of things you went over can take much longer than it should. So oh, sure. just like your coaching staff would on a sports team, uh, there, there need to be team members that are accountable for coming to the meeting with some of this information already in hand. And, and one thing that I'll mention in particular that, um, that you touched on, and I was reawakened to the importance of this uh, a few months ago was is the route slip or the patient visit form, which actually with most softwares, you can have it tell you uh, who, what family members that are on that account that don't have an appointment. So it's one less screen click when you're chair side. And even if you're paperless, uh, that's some paper that's worth recycling right there to print those route slips and have someone review them the day before so that they're ready you know, to talk about whatever that is, and, and it's easier to remember when you're chairside. So for all of you green folks out there, um, what I like to say is plant a couple of trees once or twice a year to make up for the paper that you're still using, and then, Wayne, that can be great social media visibility, you and your team tree planting. I love it. You are full of great ideas, and um, I I totally concur with what you said regarding the route slip. Uh, it, it is very informative. Let's talk about <clears throat> being on time. Research by Future Donics um, suggests that the number one factor determining whether a patient will or will not return to your practice is being seated on time. Now, I don't understand the medical model uh, at all. I've, I've never understood how um, I can be one of 15 people appointed uh, for the same 2 o'clock appointment and be called <laughs> back at you know, 3.15. I, I don't get it. But uh. We have a huge advantage in dentistry because we commonly um, do 
routine procedures throughout each day, and it's easy to time those most often performed procedures so we know generally how long it takes. We can take advantage of uh, practice management software today with the 10-minute uh, time increment, unlike the 15-minute time increment, which was popular <laughs> in the 70s and the 80s. Mm -hmm. So we have six units of time per hour to play with. And, and if we're going to do a procedure that is perhaps a little more difficult because of where it is in the mouth or if it's a difficult patient because of uh, access or the patient's tongue, we add another unit or two of time. And, and that way... Uh, we're not going to be running late. We're not going to, going to be stressed out. And I also think it's critically important to always have an empty chair. That room is clean. It's prepped. And you can insert that uh, hard to numb patient uh, uh, in advance of the restorative appointment. Uh, you you can uh, allow the hygienist to move to that room if um, if that uh, an, a natural hygiene appointment has has run a little bit long. It, or just being able to seat that emergency to re-cement that crown or diagnose uh, uh, pain for a, a referral. So 10-minute uh, appointment book, time your procedures, uh, add a unit or two for a difficult patient or difficult procedure, and always have an empty chair. And you will stay on time, and guess what? Your team will love you, your patients will love you, and Along with that concept, I've always believed it's important for the doctor to interrupt the hygiene appointment uh, when it's easiest for the doctor to excuse himself or herself from the patient being treated so that the hygienist isn't waiting and waiting and waiting at the end of an appointment. So being on time can be done, and it's a huge advantage for us, and it makes a tremendous impact on whether or not that patient is going to return to your practice. I think I think you're right on, and if anything, when we're on time for the patient, it lets them know that we respect their time, and which I think makes them feel important and significant. And then when we're not on time, boy, doesn't that create a myriad of issues with trying to hold them accountable when they're not on time uh, for <laughs> sure. the practices that struggle with that. And then you want to tell the patient if they're 20 minutes late that you may reschedule their appointment. And they're thinking, well, you never see me on time. Uh, so I think that is huge. And probably, I'm sure some of the listeners may think, really, Penny Reed? Probably one of the easiest things to be able to get a grasp on once you time your procedures with, you know, a few exceptions. But you usually know if a patient has the potential to be difficult uh, either personality-wise or procedure-wise before you schedule them. So I couldn't agree more with being on time. Well said. Thank you. I think that uh, we also have an advantage knowing not only who's coming in, but when they're coming in. We've got our schedule right on the desktop monitor, and it surprises me how few practices uh, take advantage of the opportunity to, to greet their patients by name. I know that Team members are often quite busy in the practice or on the phone when a patient arrives, but they really should, I think, make a point of speaking to them as soon as it's feasible, or at least look up and give them a smile and a wave and chat with them later. But personally welcoming and thanking each patient for their on-time arrival is definitely a patient pleaser, and it's what you just said. I think it shows respect to the patient, and it shows that we value uh, our relationship. I also think that, uh, again, <laughs> paperless or not, if you have personal notes uh, made uh, from appointment to appointment um, about each patient, it, it gives the staff some touch points to to comment on as the patient is being seated, whether it's uh, uh, they, they just did have a a uh, family trip to Disney World or uh, mm -hmm. uh, a cruise or a vacation or a time at the beach. But it, it's uh, nice to uh, to have those little personal touch points and personalize uh, uh, the uh, relationship. Uh, yeah, that's, I think, showing that appreciation for them. And, Wayne, I, I know you were have been in dentistry longer than I, a little bit longer than I have. That's one of the things that I miss about the paper chart. It, we had a, a sheet, and most offices did. It usually was 
I believe in our office it was blue. And whenever there were those events that were coming up for patients or, you know, a, a child getting married or graduating or a grandbaby or, you know, on the sad side, maybe an illness, it was right there in front of us. And now with the technology, we put it in a note. We have to be intentional to look at those notes. So it can be done, but we definitely have to be focused. Um, I, don't, I don't know about you, but in the practices with larger patient bases, it's hard to store all of that in your brain. So we need very, to be sure much. not only that we capture it, but you know, if, if you're like most listeners, you don't have that paper chart anymore with that little cheat sheet. So you need to be sure and pull that information up intentionally to be able to uh, talk about it with them. Very well said, and I, and I think that it goes back to the importance of uh, staff stability, having that mm -hmm. uh, hygienist that, uh, that can uh, have the opportunity and time to establish that close personal relationship with each patient. And interestingly enough, um, I have found that, that, for example, the two hygienists that were in my practice the longest, one for 22 years and one for 23 years, uh, they had encyclopedic knowledge of the people that they were seeing and didn't even need those cheat sheets. So again, mm. uh, staff stability uh, means a great deal in keeping uh, a good personal relationships uh, with, your, with your patients. So true. Well, final topic is to listen well. Um, you know, patients want to be heard, and I think Good listening uh, has become a lost art, especially in, in health, uh, the healthcare field. Uh, if we listen carefully to one's comments and concerns, uh, not only does that help us diagnose more appropriately, but I believe it contributes to establishing a close patient relationship, trust, and therefore improved treatment acceptance. I always found it awkward uh, entering the hygiene room, uh, interrupting the hygienist uh, often, and the patient was uh, in, in the, um, the reclined position. Um, my hygienist knew when I came in and greeted the patient and was washing my hands that they <clears throat> immediately stopped, rinsed the patient, and uh, uh, brought the seat back up to the sitting position. I never liked speaking to a patient uh, when they were prone unless I was seated beside them, uh, perhaps doing the exam. But I always thought it was important to uh, uh, face them and uh, be at uh, eye level so that what I had to say was uh, meaningful to them and was heard. But more importantly, I was in a position to hear what the patient was telling me as well. Again, I think it uh, is a sign of uh, respect, but um, it's also uh, critically important in, in taking a practice from, from good to great because it's uh, rarely uh, done. Uh, one other thought, and I was inconsistent with this, but from time to time, I enjoyed having a new patient interview in the consultation room before they ever got to the operatory, um, especially uh, when we had uh, knowledge through the new patient phone call uh, that mm -hmm. uh, there, there was an involved medical history, perhaps, or um, the patient uh, was coming from another practice with some concerns. And I always liked to to ex examine that or explore those uh, issues privately in the consultation room before going to the operatory. And so you actually did that, or, did, or was it occasionally that you had a team member that did that? Both, both. Um, okay. Uh, it's best if it's delegated. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and my, my chair side did a lot of that for me, but uh, there, there were a number of occasions when, when I would do it because I had a heads up that there was a potential issue, especially if they were coming from another practice and they were unhappy uh, with, mm -hmm. with uh, you know, so I wanted to do that. And, and I generally had my chair side in there with me uh, to make notes. Well, I was in an office a few weeks ago, and, and I'm not telling this to tell on that office, but it's happened more times than I care to imagine in different offices where there has been a question about health history and the administrative team member has asked, you know, well, are these all of your prescriptions or what have you, where I can hear it. And, you know, I think if I was the patient, I might not necessarily, you know, want that to happen. But in this one particular office, this gentleman, I came to the front, and I guess he thought that I worked there, you know, didn't realize that I was a consultant. And, and he said, such and such is being mean to me. She's being mean to me. 
I said, she's not being mean to you because she was asking him, you know, persistently questions about his prescriptions. I said, she's trying to be sure that when you get to the back that they don't do something that causes you to sprout wings in a tutu. (laughs) Well, when I pulled his paperwork, he had had a heart attack the prior week. And so, no, I do think... It, that's a great we, – we build those consultation rooms usually thinking that that is where we're going to do the triple reverse close, right, <laughs> to close the big cases, which which does happen, okay? I mean, that that's part of it. But the other – I strongly encourage a, you know, a visit, an administrative part of the appointment to be sure that we've got all the information, questions about the insurance, because if you don't have that, then we're definitely having – sensitive conversations regarding pertinent information for a new patient with an audience. Uh, yes. So I, I strongly agree, you know, if it can be the doctor, that's wonderful. If it's the hygienist or an assistant or even if it's an administrative team member, I think that is a wonderful way to start out that new patient appointment. Great insight, Penny. Um, you know, I'm just I'm just a guy who uh, practiced dentistry. You've got all the smarts uh, through your practice management consulting. and I, Oh, I don't know I, about that. I think you have, uh, with what you've accomplished, and, you know, you're, you're living the dream, which is why it's an honor to have you well, as part of the podcast, is, you know, for whether it's someone that's brand new to dentistry or maybe they sort of hit the wall, you know, if you do anything long enough, you go through those ups and downs, and, you know, perhaps some folks are stuck and looking for, you know, ways to get back on track. So, uh, you know, from someone who who did practice uh, for 30 years and then was able to successfully transition out, I think your perspective, what is it that they say about the rearview mirror, is way more clear than looking ahead. And, and for you to be able to share these pearls with the listeners, I think, is just fabulous. Well, you're very kind, Penny. I, I, I can't thank you enough. There are many ways that you can set your practice apart from others, but I truly believe that incorporating some of the concepts we've talked about today will absolutely help anyone take their practice from good to great. Thanks, Penny. Thanks for listening to Growing Your Dental Business podcast. For more information, transcripts, and resources, please visit us at growingyourdentalbusiness.com. 